Peace, Mike Geronimo, right here, Report Card Radio, with my guy, Biggest in Charge, Mikey T, the superstar. We here, y'all. Major facts, man. Mike Geronimo, I want to welcome you to Report Card Radio. You know, it's amazing to have you on the channel today. Nah, man, the pleasure is all mine. Like I said, man, and we two mics, so it's always better when you got another mic around. So I'm glad to be here, bro. Facts, man. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. It seems like people from your year, like 1973, 1974, had it made. I mean, my brother, he was working for <laughs> New Line Cinema. You uh -huh. were working with the hottest producers. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's something with that seven and that three together. I don't know what it is. But, yeah, it, it was um some good stuff to, to have under your belt. You know what I mean? Good stuff to have under my belt. Uh, I got to work with a lot of people that I would have never imagined I was going to work with. And then I got to work with a lot of people that I always wanted to work with. So I'm very grateful for that. Very appreciative for that. Yo, and we're going to get into all of that, man. But can you tell mm -hmm. me what it was that actually drew you into music in the first place? Um... I think I always had a love for music. Like when I was a kid, uh, I remember my first set of drums. I was like eight years old. It was like a, a set of Bee Gees drums, if you could believe it. But, um, you know, I always had drums. Uh, I played the recorder. I played the piano. I played the keyboard. So I think I always had something in me that gravitated towards music. Um, and then in terms of becoming an actual artist, that's a little more tricky because that kind of happened on its own. You know, I started out as a DJ. So, you know, I had Technique 1200s and Gemini mixers and, and, and all that good stuff, gem sound speakers. So that's how I got my start. But I also grew up with large professors, shout out to Law. So um, just growing up with large and him becoming you know, a major force in hip hop. Uh, I would be exposed to to stuff every day that I went to his crib. So, you know, like Gangstar would come to his house, or Pete Rock, or, or Leaders of the New School, or Q Tip, and that would just that could be a Tuesday, that could be today. You know, they would just float through, and I was like his little brother, so I was always there. So I was always surrounded by this stuff. And the more that I was around it, I would just freestyle. And in the beginning, it would have, you know, I'd just have my boys laughing. They'd be like, yo, you know, you be saying something when you spit, but you don't take it serious. So then the more that I actually did start saying to myself, well, what if I do dedicate the time to actually write, you know, raps and all of that? Right, let's see how that goes. And then I did, you know, I still really wasn't. Like, it wasn't like I was doing it and saying, all right, I'm doing this in the hopes to become an MC and, and, and sell a lot of records and all of that. I, I never looked at it that way. I just looked at it like it's something I like doing and I'm getting better at doing it from what I'm being told. And then from there, it was just a natural progression to, to move away from DJing and more into, you know, MCing. So was it hard for you back then to actually start recording, like to put your vocals on a track? For example, Cube and Dr. Dre seemed to have to push Easy e you know, when he actually got in the booth. No, no. Like, it, it wasn't a thing where I didn't have any reservations at all about recording. It actually, the funny part was the first time that I ever really recorded, I ended up doing Shit's Real with Irv Gotti. And I remember when we was doing it and he kind of stopped me halfway through the song and he was like, um, yo, you never did this before? You never recorded before? And I was like, nah, never. And he's like, never? Not like not at large crib, none of that. I was like, nah, never in my life. And he just did this laugh. You know what I mean? And like a, it was like a a a, a sinister but but yeah type laugh. And then he just kept recording me. So and I just kept going. And to me, it was fun. To me, it was amazing to be able to hear 
your voice. You know what I mean? Like we hear our voices all the time when we talk and, and do things during the day, but you don't ever hear your voice in the way that people hear your voice. Right. You know what I mean? So, 100%. so just to be able to hear what I sound like to someone else, and and to hear it in a rhythm like that in itself was amazing to me. So I just have fun doing it, bro. So was it really uh, that chance encounter at the talent show with uh, DJ Irv that led you guys to jumping in the studio together? Yeah, pretty much. I, I wouldn't really say it was a chance encounter. The reason being is because we had a mutual friend named Chucky Madness that I went to school with. And I actually would go to Chuck's house every weekend because he was a DJ and Chuck would cut records up and record me on a low. And I guess he was going back and telling Irv about me. And he had told Irv to actually come up to the talent show that day. So we met that night. Uh, you know, we I just thought, I remember rapping for him in his ear and he just was laughing like, yeah, yeah. Then, you know, the venue we was at, it got shot up. So we all got separated. And I think about a week or two after that, he had called me. And again, he was, you know, like, yo, I got a studio. Why don't you come try it? If you don't like it, you know, you don't have to do it. And then um, that was it. We just, from that encounter, the next move was, was the studio. And then after that, it was, it was off and running. So I want to ask, like, how did your relationship with Irv turn into a deal with TVT Records? Did Irv have anything to do with that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did Shit's Real, and then Irv had went and got Hype Williams to shoot the video. So Hype and his boy Izzy came out, and we shot this video on his camera that was about this big. And then we had the video and we were starting to get a little bit of a response from the public. But Irv was under the impression that like, yo, we're not gonna wait, you know, for labels. Like, I'm gonna press it up. And I was like, well, how are we doing that? He's like, I don't know, we'll figure it out, but we did. And we pressed up a couple of 12 inches and we gave those out to DJs all over the city. Uh, he would sleep in front of Hot 97 and wait for whatever DJ was on the air to, to come about to, to, to give them the record. He sent me in the nightclub and I'll give the record to whoever was spinning at whatever club we was going to. And then, um, and then from there, I guess label started to contact him because he had put his contact information on the 12 inches, I think. And so labels already were interested, but once we had did the video and pressed the song up, it kind of pushed everything. And so Irv was the one who the labels would call and he would, you know, read to see which was the best situation. So he had everything in the world to do with that. Definitely. Shout out to the guy. That's what's up, man. That's dope. You know, there was a lot of labels back then, like Loud, TVT. You know, yeah. one of the most notable stories I know from TVT, though, is when Ja Rule signed there and with a group, the Cash Money Click, and then mm -hmm. he went on to have a few issues once he blew up as a solo artist. Yeah. So what was your experience like at TVT? Well, for me, it was a little bit different as a, as a, a compared to Rule for the simple fact that I was the first hip hop artist they had ever signed. So with me, it was kind of like, I was kind of like their baby new year, figuratively speaking. So I was the first artist rap wise they'd ever signed. And I had a pretty good relationship with the label president, the owner. I had a good relationship with the majority of the staff there. So, um, and my contractual situation was night and day to hit. And then the other part of that was, you know, the, not only were they brand new, but this is their first time encountering maybe some sort of a, of a cross marketing or, or, or a, a, a cross scenario with another label with an artist that they already had signed. So there was a lot of red tape. Um, there were also, I think, you know, like 
for lack of a better way to put it, personal issues between, you know, the president of, of Def Jam and the president of TVT. And I think that muddied the waters a lot more um, regarding rule and Yep, one label what he was, doesn't want the other to be bigger. Exactly, and regarding, you know, where he was able to move and what he was able to do. And he pretty much was an innocent bystander, you know, caught between these two labels, you know, fighting over what he's allowed to do and what he's not. So it was very different variables involved in both scenarios. But um, all in all, I had a, a pretty decent relationship with TV2. Yeah, you dropped two albums over there, right? Yeah, yeah, two albums. That's what's up, man. And, uh, you know, I got to ask you, man, how did you go from working with Irv Gotti and then linking with Diddy? I mean, these are, I'm talking about the hottest producers in the game earlier. You worked with them. Uh-huh. It, it all, like I said, with me, bro, a lot of things just, they, they just happened. They fell into place. My cousin. Shout out to Barnes. My cousin Barnes is very good friends with Diddy. And I don't even think at that time that they knew that Barnes was family to me. Um, but the minute that I met, you know, like Harv and and Puff and Nassim and 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 Prestige and D Dot and everybody there, it kind of was like another home for me. Um they definitely took me under the wing and they were really eager to work with me and I was really eager to work with them. Harv was from Queens, I was from Queens. So that also made it, you know, that added to it like, yo, we could work together and do something for the borough and all this other stuff. So it just all fell into place. And then, you know, me and Diddy, like Diddy was cool from day one. He was always like big bro to me. You know, so we just had a really cool relationship where, you know, we was like, yo, man, we should do some music. And even if I wasn't doing anything where he was on it, he was always very, um, like, he would always come in and listen to what I'm doing. And he would always, you know, like, be like yo, do it this way, try it this way, try it this So he always had input in what I was doing. And then when the time came, it just... It just worked out where it was like, yeah, we can work together and, and make some shit. And that's what we did. You know, so shout out to Diddy, Bad Boy, rest in peace, Black Rob, my G for life, you know. Yeah, rest in peace, Black Rob. I actually had a, a couple opportunities to meet BR, man. And yeah. you must have uh, you must have had an opportunity to work with my guy, Stevie J, as well. Yeah, yeah, I know Steve. Shout out to Steve. We didn't actually get to do... I, like, I didn't actually get to do any of his production, but Steve was definitely there during a lot of the, 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 the times that we did work. So even if I was in, like, the little van room they had with it, they actually had a room in Bad Boy that was designed to be the inside of a van. And it had, like, car audio equipment so that you would get the feeling of what your music sounded like in a car. So even if I was in that little van room just listening to shit, me and Steve would, you know, he would be around. So shout out to him as well. Yeah, Stevie's a good dude. I actually got the chance to meet Stevie uh, when I was working with uh, uh, Hip Hop Weekly in Miami, actually. Okay, yeah. Steve's good people and stuff, good people. So, man, you know, I, I find it uh, hard to be I find it like, like, did he never offered you a contract for Bad Boy Records? There was never uh, talk about that? I mean, we may have had, we may have conversed about it, you know, about those possibilities, but it never had gotten to the point of, you know, like, all right, this is what we're going to do. And I don't think at that time, like, I didn't really feel the need to, like, it, it, it wasn't of necessity because, as I said, we were all so cool and it wasn't anything that we wouldn't do you know, for each other. Like, it's not like he couldn't call me and, and he did plenty of times and be like, yo, bro, I'm doing this mixtape I need you to hop on or yo, I'm doing this song or I might have did a song. He might have did a song and been like, yo, I want you to hear what I spit. Like, so we just had that sort of relationship where it didn't really require for me to be signed to Bad Boy. I knew they were there and they knew the same with me, you know? That's love right there, Mike. Yes, sir. All right, so, yo, we're going to uh, shift the topic right here, and I want to ask you, man, 
can you tell me about meeting 50 Cent? How did you two actually meet? And you know, you two are actually only two years difference in age. Yeah, uh, shout out Fifth. We met actually because um, good friends of mine from the hometown named Darkside, they knew 50. And they was doing a song with him. And I forget if it was him that suggested it or if it was them that suggested it. Somehow another, somebody had suggested that I get on the song. And so, you know, they pretty much just asked me, like, his people asked my people, his people and my people knew each other. And he asked me, and I was like, yeah, no worries. So I think that day I came up to the studio, he was there. You know, we chilled, I did the hook, he loved it. Um, and the rest was history. The rest was history. So shout out to him as well. Right. So that record is called The Evil That Men Do. Um, Correct. What do you most remember about that song, man? Not too much other than, you know, like he was happy with the hook. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I remember us standing there and then I remember like just saying, I'm like, yo, I got it. And he's like, what's up? I, was like, I got the hook. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I got it. And I just went in and said it and he dug it, you know, and, and that was cool. That was cool. So it was a good experience. So how was 50 Cent compared to other rappers from uh, Queens at the time? Or had you not known him, was it really the connection with Dark Side? I, did, I mean, I knew of him and I had heard of him. And he was definitely making waves at that point. But I didn't really know much about him. And up until that point, I had never met him. So with me, I, I'm a pretty easy person. Like, all it takes for me is to meet somebody. And if we vibe, then we're cool. If we don't vibe, then it just is what it is. And, you know, we met and we vibed out. You know, and, and I think this was prior to all of these other things fermenting and becoming bigger than you know they were at that point so that didn't really come into play you know and I just remember he was real cool wasn't really saying too much but it was just real cool just real cool like we was just both vibing and we we was both like yeah this is cool and that was that you know did he have the homie yayo with him nah no, nah, I think it was actually, I think that day, if I'm not mistaken, which ironically enough, one of them called me this morning. I think it was just me, him, and Darkside, and Darkside is Doc and Sin. So I think it was just me, him, Doc, Sin. It might have been one or two other people in the studio. We did it right at Black. Yeah. And, and, and from there, it was just a regular session, easy session, easy session. Oh, you said Bangham Smurf was there? No, I don't think Smurf was there, bro. I don't think Smurf was there that day. And I know Smurf, so I think I'd have remembered if he was there that day. Smurf wasn't there that day. But shout out Smurf. Salute to my homie Smurf, man. Definitely yeah. salute to Smurf, man. So so you had uh, briefly mentioned it, man. And, and what did you think of 50 Cent's beef with Murder Rank and, and him really trying to tear down Irv and Ja's career? Um... I mean, past the obvious, I didn't give it too much thought. You know, the obvious is, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate. And like I said, I'm I'm cool with everybody. You know, I've always been cool with everybody. But with that being said, it was kind of disturbing to see, you know, him attacking people that you got love for, you know. So in that sense of... of, of watching my brothers being attacked. No, that wasn't easy to, to you know, to, to, to watch or to observe. But then again, Rule is a big boy, so I knew he could handle whatever came his way. Um, and I know my people, you know, so, and I, it was a very, it's a very, um, it was a very precarious situation, you yeah. know, so um, so I just tried to do the best I could do to, to, to walk a fine line, I guess you could speak, say, you know, and um, 
And with me, I, you know, I was just like, you know, as long as, you know, God be willing, nothing happens and I'm around, you know, where I wouldn't want to witness certain things or, or I wouldn't want to be a part of anything unfortunate. You know, it was just that, you know, but um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Not even from the perspective of being a house out observer. It wasn't easy. You know, you did the record, Evil That Men Do. Did this present in any, like, issue? Like, did it affect your relationship at all with Irv Gotti, Murder Inc., Ja, any of the guys? Not at all. Not at all. Because you got to remember when we did that song, this was prior to everything coming to its boiling point. You know, and, and I think, too, I think the people around me, they respected the fact that, you know, I'm always cool with anyone, with everyone. And so I didn't get any any sort of uh, friction or or opposition or, and they knew I was going to do it. You know, they knew that and they didn't at all. No resume. They actually was like, yeah, you need to do it. You know, so. But again, this is before a lot of things had, had developed and changed and became something else. So would it have been the same if it was at that point? I don't know. I can't say because I only know the time that we was in, that we did what we did in there. So, yeah, you know, I didn't really get too much blowback. You know, Mike, I just want to say, you know, it just comes to mind, like you – uh, Nori, Nas, you guys are a lot of the early artists that actually, you guys are the ones who gave 50 Cent his early life in the music industry to show the people out there watching that he could really have a music career, you know what I mean, with real staples mm -hmm. in the industry. Mm -hmm. He deserves it. I mean, he deserves it. I mean, he's good. In, in terms of just being an artist and, and looking at him from the sense of an artist, he's very savvy. Um, I think his earlier material was right in the right place, right in the right time. Um, I think the combination of him and Eminem and Dre was phenomenal. Mm. And I think he's a very shrewd person in terms of, you know, he thinks just as hard about what his product is going to be as he does about how to get it out there and, and optimize it. And I think that that's to be, you know, that's admirable. You know, so me personally, I'm happy for all my people from the town that made it, you know, because I could reflect on the days when none of us had anything. So to see him go from that to, you know, directing BMF, like, uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I want to ask you, man, when was it that Nas told you that you should be on the radio? Uh, it was, I had did, I went to large crib, I went to large professor's crib maybe a couple of days after we did Shit's Real. And I actually was going to play Nas the B-side, Him and Heads, because we sampled him. So I wanted him to hear it, you know, so he could, you know, that this is the, the homage to my homie, this is to you or whatever. And we played Eminem, and he didn't really like Eminem, <laughs> the one with his sample. But he likes his real, and he was just like, he's like the B side. He's like, yo, yo, that B side, you know, the shit with my voice. Like, yo, I don't really know about that, but yo, that shit's real shit. Yo, you should be on the radio tomorrow with that. And that kind of shocked me, you know, because. For so many different reasons. One, you know, I'm getting to know him as a person because he's in my neighborhood now on a frequent basis. Two, he's a phenomenal MC. Like, I'd never known anybody rapping like that before I heard him. And three, you know, I saw how much of a, a regard Large had for him. So for him to say that to me, you know, while I'm you know, I'll, I'm turning on video music box and halftime is coming up. So to me, it was just mind blowing that hair and be like, yo, that shit should be on the radio. And that was kind of like, I think it was like the last little bit of personal confirmation that I needed, 
you know, from anything outside of myself to 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 let me feel like, yeah, maybe you are on to something. So for him to say that to me that day was big. Shout out to now. So, Mike, we were speaking on it a little bit earlier about, you know, not really – knowing your voice, not hearing the voice the same way that everyone else does. Do you think that that was something being so early, you know, in the nineties and shit, what, do you think it was something like that, that Nas was thinking maybe like not really being as fully comfortable with his voice? I, I mean, I don't know. Like I, you would definitely have to ask him, you know, where he would know better than anyone. I think that we all before we're asserted in something, we all, as humans, human nature, everyone has doubt, you know, like to what degree you have doubts, it, it depends on the individual. But I think everybody has a, a little bit of, 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 well, what if this or what if that? Because you just don't know until you figuratively jump in the water and swim, right. you know, so. But I, I, if he did have any reservations or if he did have any doubt, I think it was probably very, very minimal. You know, I, I I believe he's so talented that it's not like he didn't know how talented he was. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, but I think we all go through that, you know, and, and I don't know with him, you know, if he had to do anything to make himself more comfortable or what the case may be, but he was on point from day one. So... So, yo, Mike, I want to ask you, man, after Nas told you that you should be on the radio, did you realize that music was for you at that point? No, not even not even then. I don't think that I've ever really realized that music was for me. I just think that it's a part of me in the sense of, you know, you don't ask for the things that make you you, you know, like, you don't. You just hit this earth the way that you are, and you 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 have what's in you because it is, and and so with me, um, <laughs> like I don't know that I ever looked at it like, all right, this is for me. I just knew that whatever I ended up doing, I would always want to make everybody proud, and I would always want to know that whatever I did it was the thing for me to be doing. So I think once I found that sense about it, where I was like, yeah, for some strange reason, you should be doing this now. Don't ask me why, but you should. And that's how I felt about it. And I just stuck with it. <laughs> that's, that's it. Can you tell me about the relationship that you got to have with Jay-Z? Yeah, I mean... um, I met him through Gotti, you know, the much in the same way that I met X and Rule, and um, and we were just cool the minute that we met, you know. And um, I think really with all four of us, maybe it's because you know, Irv had such a part to play in all our careers, and I think that we were all kind of heading somewhere at the same time. I don't think we all realized where. We were going, but um, that in itself helped the camaraderie, and that in itself helped, you know, the 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 bond. And then, you know, as time passed and he became more successful, and you know, all of us are are putting music out. And we're all, you know, moving through it. Like we would all always, you know, be at each other's events or or each other's shows or. If Rockefeller had a party, we would all go. If the Ink had a party, they would all come. Rough Riders would be there. So there was always this bond between us and Rough Riders and Rock and Rockefeller. And I think that bond grew from the bond that me, Irv, Jay, Ja, and X had. You know, so it was just amazing how it all developed. And I'm honored to say that these are the people that I, I started with and that, you know, they started with me and it's an amazing feeling. It's an amazing thing. So I want to ask you about working with these guys, man. Ja, mm -hmm. Jay-Z, DMX, Time to Build, 
Is this a record that you all got in the studio together to record, or did Irv take it around to each of the guys, man? He kind of did that. Um, I think the only two people, I think me and Rule were, no, no, no. I actually think I laid my verse first. Um, and then I think Rule heard, and then he laid his verse. But we both recorded at Diner Dog. Then I can't remember if X went before J or J went before X. But they, he took it to each of us individually. I think that initially we probably were going to be together, at, at least me and Rule in the same session. But it was no big deal. He, he took it to each of us and we all did what we were doing. And I had no idea that at that time that, you know, X and J had like a little rivalry. I didn't know. So, you know, when I first heard the song, I'm just hearing them spit. But then Irv's the one who points out to me, like, no, Jay is dissing X in his verse. And then he's like, but X is dissing Jay in his verse. Wow. So then when I listened again, I was like, that's just fucking crazy. You know, so amazing, amazing event. Amazing record. Wow, that's crazy, man, because we heard that yeah. more recently in uh, Young Bucks, Young Bucks' debut album. He actually had Ludacris and T.I. on the same record, Stomp, and they were both dissing each other. Um, G-Unit yeah. -Unit and Interscope later removed T.I. and replaced him with the game, you know, strategically. Right, exactly. exactly. Now, we, we kept it G. We left everybody in place. Wow, man. So what was Irv trying to do right there, placing Rule, X, and J on, on your album on a record together? What was he trying to sell a million records, trying to make the greatest <laughs> record of all time? What was he trying to do? I don't think we even, I mean, again, he, he could probably answer it better than me, but I, he's so much of a visionary, bro. And knowing Gotti, he probably saw something that, the rest of us didn't see. And I think he, it was probably one of those moments where he saw something and he was just like, yo, I know what to do. And he did, you know, and I don't think that any of us in hindsight, I don't think any of us thought that for one moment that that song or that that moment was going to be a defining moment in terms of whatever what happens afterwards um but i definitely think it was like a precursor or it was kind of a um it was kind of like the the looking into the possibility of well what if you had a super group and what if you had mcs that were they're not just potent this way, but they're potent that way. And you have one that's this and one that's that, one that's this. And I think he had that vision and he just wanted it captured. Yeah, that group, they always speculate that the group was actually going to be called Murder Inc., you know, but it turned out to be a record label. So I want to ask you, mm -hmm. looking at those three, even though Irv came to you and said, yo, X and J are dissing each other on this record, listen to it. Did you look at them three like a super group? Nah, I just looked at them like that's my people. <laughs> like, you know, but like I said, with me, it was very different. Like, I didn't concentrate on maybe things that people would. I didn't think about those things. So I just looked at it like I'm having the time of my life being around people that love to rap because that makes me want to rap, you know, so... That's all that I was getting from it. And just the fact, like, it's just dope to have friends that you you can record music with and then you can chill out with after. So it's cool, you know. So, Mike, I want to ask, man, how did you form such a tight relationship with Ja Rule? Um, we just clicked. Like, the minute we met, we clicked. And I knew Chris Black and I knew O One. one Right. You know, like I knew Chris Black actually before I knew Rule and, and Oprah. But when I did meet Rule, we clicked. And then it ended up like I would go over to his crib in Woodhall on the weekend and I might crash over there, you know. Um, 
just chill out in his neighborhood. And then, you know, whenever I had a session, he would come. And, and then it just became very natural for all of us to just have that whole, you know, that, that bond, that, that wherever one went, the other one went. You know, we we was all on the same team, so it 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 it, it, it just made it that much cooler that when we did meet, we did click, we did bond, and the rest was history. Yo, man, at one point, Ja Rule was arguably the hottest of the three. At one point, mm -hmm. Ja Rule was arguably the hottest rapper in the game. Mhm, mm mhm, mm yeah. yeah, and but I, I think. Um, I don't think that there was any bad de de Def Jam during that time because you had X who was just out of this world and you had Jay who was out of this world and Rule who also was out of this world and each of them did things that didn't just, you know, they didn't just exceed the mark, but they just every single time would take it to a brand new level. Right. And I know with Rule, he was very passionate about um, where he could take his music. He was very passionate about, you know, in terms of being a writer, what could he try next? What kind of song worked next? And I think for him, the creativity is half the fun. So he would just lock down and the more successful he was, the more focused he would get in terms of, okay, what's the next thing? And that was remarkable to see, you know, because it's not, I don't ever think that I've ever seen a moment where Rule was content with what he had done. He always wanted to do like, nah, nah, okay, that's just the beginning. Wait till I do this. And he was always driven to do something major and, to watch that develop and to watch that flourish, it was awesome. Yeah, look what he did. He ended up, you know, he ended up making records with Jennifer Lopez that'll be remembered yeah, with, forever. I mean, with J Lo and 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 he, he was in the Fast and the Furious series and right. you know from I there. Told he you know, so I was like, I was the first one to ask Ja Rule. I was like, Rule, why didn't you do the role in Too Fast, Too Furious, Big Bro? I was the first <laughs> one to ask him that shit. Right, right. But I mean, he branched off into so many other things. And even now to watch him, you know, building and developing and working Icon, his company, like even that's just cool to see. So yeah, Jazz the man. Absolutely. That's my bro, man. I'm very proud of him. I'm very happy for him. All right. So we're going to go into something else here that I hope you can give me some insight on being a, a a lyrical genius yourself, being a music guy, man. What did you end up thinking of Jay-Z and Nas going at each other, man? How did it feel to live through that? Um, it's kind of weird. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, I mean, from my standpoint, it was weird because I have love for both of them. You know, and, and Nas is pretty much from the hood. And, you know, Hove is pretty much my people that, you know, I rock with because we family through through this connection. So it was very awkward, to say the least, you know, but they, they were two, they're two grizzly bears. So you, what are you going to do? You going to get in the middle of two grizzly bears fighting? No. <laughs> you know, so you let the grizzly bears do what they do and get it out their system and you, I guess, hope for the best. And that was pretty much it. You know, I think now that we're able to, to, to be in a place where we're so far removed from that period, like now you can look at it and you can see, you know, some of the good things that came from it inadvertently. But no, was it pleasant to watch or an experience? Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, did you ever see it coming and did it really separate New York? I don't know that it separated New York. I don't think that it did that. Did I see it coming? I don't know that I saw it coming, but I don't think I was terribly surprised when it did happen. Um, but it, 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 
it forced, I guess, people in New York to 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 choose the red red pill or the blue pill, in a sense, you know. So, I don't think it divided New York. I just think it was a matter of what your taste buds requested and and what you dug more and whichever one of those MCs embodied more of what you dug, that's who you chose, that's who you ran with. But I mean, it was a hell of a battle. It was like Ali and Frazier all over again. Yeah, a lot of people like to say shit about Nas eventually signing to Jay-Z later on. But if Jay's able to give him a platform that he really needs, you know, no. I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, but, you know, I, I say it all the time. People are always going to say something. And usually... Usually they say more when they know less, which is <laughs> so, so, I mean, people are going to always say something. But in the end, I mean, in the end, it turned out great. Icons. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I, to see the, 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 the businessman that Jay's become and, you know, Nas as well with, with his, his investments. Yeah, the investments that he he's fortunate enough to have made, and and you know, congratulations to him and Hip Boy for the Grammy that you know he, for years he deserved to get one and he finally got one. Right. So I think all in all, um, if you look at the whole picture, maybe it's just the period of time that was required to get to this masterpiece that we all get to see now. So you got I look at it that way. I look at it that way. I, I don't at all look at it like, oh, well, Nas lost and then Hov signed. And then, yeah, okay, but I mean, they both ate together. And, and that's actually testament to two people being able to be men enough to put their differences aside, which were very considerable personal differences. And they found a way to work together. And that's amazing. That's what people should give credit to. Can we talk about DMX for a minute, man? Yeah, we we could talk about it. I want to speak talk. on I want to speak on one of the greatest artists to ever touch a mic, to ever sell a record. You know, to mm -hmm. me, DMX is one of the most inspirational artists to ever exist. Agreed, agreed. My kids right now, funny enough, my youngest son, who's five, is actually in my living room now because he discovered the greatest. Uh, the best of DMX on Music Choice last night. <laughs> so he's watching it again in the living room. So. Yeah, I, I actually uh, first listened to DMX when I was 10 years old in 1998, you know. Wow. I, was, I was born in 88, so his albums had come out in 98, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I always tell my followers, my listeners, I really got into music like right after Pac and Big Past. Because I was mm -hmm. really only like seven, eight years old in 95, 96. I wasn't really all the way there. You know, I was a little right. kid. Right. You still have, yeah, I get it. I get it. Putting together toy guns with Legos and shit like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but, um, but, yo, what's something about DMX that you will never forget, Mike? Oh, man, bro. There's so much, Mike. You know, um, There's so much, like, um, I remember we were in Boomer. He had a low rider called Boomer. Boomer was his dog that passed away. And um, he had this white low rider and he had Boomer airbrushed on. It was either the trunk or the hood. I want to say the trunk. Um, and we were in the city. I don't even know what happened, but he called me, whatever he came, he got me from somewhere. And he's just driving like a madman through the city, which if you knew X, he drove like a madman, like all the time. Um, and my brother was trying to follow behind us in his car. Um, so we were in like a parking lot. And it had one of those like gates that lifts up to let the cars out. And my brother's in a truck behind us. And like X is 
flying towards the barricade thing. And at first I'm like, no, nah, there's no way he won't, he won't, he is, he is, he go, oh my God, shit. So he, drove, <laughs> so he drove under it, but we cleared it. We cleared it. And my brother's truck could not clear it. And my brother calls me like two minutes later, cursing up the store. He's like, yo, I'm fucking mad. Man. I'm going to kill him. Yo, I almost lost the front of my car trying to keep up with y'all. So I, I, me and Eggs like start talking. And we always, like we could always talk in a way that wouldn't bother each of us. Like he could say something to me that, you know, maybe somebody else might piss me off saying, but we just had that thing and did how I got to it. But I was just like, yo, man, you don't care enough. And he just looks at me while he's driving. He's like, dog, you care too much. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, and I just did one of these. And I was like, this sums up the nature of our relationship. You know, like he's the yin and I'm the yang and, and that's, but it's funny because as I got older and things would come about in my own life that maybe it's like, you know, maybe you want to take this risk. Maybe taking this risk will lead you to something better. So when those moments would arise in life, I would always go back to hearing him say, well, you know what, dog, you care too much. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to always give credit to him for because he was definitely one of the first people in life with me to make me understand the importance of just letting go and just doing and not worrying, but just go and do, you know, and all um, or even when we were, would record, I remember he would just be like, everything with you, my G, it gotta be, it gotta be four bars, four bars, dog. Da 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 da, 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 boom. Then again, da 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 da, 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 boom. You're in, dog. You're out, dog. It's gotta be beautiful. And just those things, you know, so I'd be lying. I'd be lying if I said it doesn't hurt. It hurts a lot. It hurts a lot. Um... But I'm so glad that I got the time with him. And I'm so glad that um I'm so glad that I could say in the end that I'm very glad that that was a friend I met in life. Very glad. You know, so um I miss him tremendously. I'm always missing because you don't really get to find people in hip hop that you can say to yourself, if I wasn't doing music or not, I would still be chilling with this person every day. And that's X. And that's, he's going to always be that to me. You know, so. I miss him very much. Did you ever get to know E Money Bags? Yeah, I knew Bags was the piece. Bags was yeah, I knew Bags. Bags was people. I knew Bags actually. Um, the first time I met Bags was years ago. Like he 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 knew my man Harm and Gam and shout out to all the young guns from you know Hollis side or whatever. So I knew Bags for a while, bro. So I got to ask you, because I don't really ever meet too many people who know, knew much about him. What type of guy was E Money Bags? He seemed like he really was an interesting character. I mean, Bags, you know, he, he, he had a sense of humor. Um, 
he had a serious side, definitely. You know, um, definitely had an ambitious side to him. You know, um, and he was street. He was street all day long. You know, so it's not too many people from that era that, that didn't know of or didn't know that. You know what I mean? Bags constantly moved around. Um, Bags was outside, like I said, in the streets, you know, and he held it down. So, you know, his reputation proceeded. Why couldn't E Money Bags get it together to put to uh, to put a rap career together? That I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I know, you know, um, towards like I guess, you know, towards towards you know when he um passed away, I remember him playing me songs that that he had, you know stashed and he had you know he had asked me if we could go in the lab i know he was tight with prodigy um because prods god bless the dead he used to always talk to me about bags after bags passed away so i know he was tight with with mob and um i know enough, a lot of people was coming to the table like if he wanted to do you know songs with him so we discussed doing stuff and then um he played me, you know, stuff that he wanted to put out, you know, but um, unfortunately, you know, things happen. Was his musical talent there, though, Mike, like on a level of a 50 cent? Could he have been at a level like that? Um, I don't really think that that's a fair comparison for the simple fact that 50 cent is who 50 cent is. You know, and and his ability lyrically, and and you know, those things that he does or 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 is that that make him rhyme the way that he does. You know, that's fifty. You know, I, I think with bags, he probably I think he was definitely putting more work in to develop his skills. Um, I think he definitely got to a point where. He's like, okay, I'm going to really work at getting good at this. So I think if he was given more time to develop, it may very well have went that way. You know, but um, I don't think it's a, uh, a fair comparison. I think one of those people always was dedicated to the run. I think the other person, you know, they investigated the possibility and then I think they came into a place where they were like, okay, I actually can and because I can, I'm gonna work on it. You know, so it's two different things. So to you, did E Money Bags really have the look of a rapper? Or is that oh, not yeah. he did have the I look mean, absolutely, yeah. I mean if this if if that era was this era, then yeah, absolutely. You understand what I'm saying? But you know, the, the the difference in that era is content was so much of a, a, a bigger part of things. You understand what I'm saying? So he definitely had the look, he had the swag, you know, he had the drip, all that shit. Wow. You know, he had all of that, you know. So is it far-fetched? No, it's not far-fetched. Not far-fetched. That's what's up, man. Can yeah, but rest me, in peace. Rest in peace to E-Money Bags, man, That's you know. I just wanted to dig into it a little bit. You know, I haven't really been able to speak to too many people who could tell me anything besides, oh, he ran up on Irv Gotti in Murder, Inc. You know, that's all anybody could really tell me. <laughs> yeah. Well, his reputation proceeded. Um, let me ask you, man. Can you tell me about getting the chance to meet Tupac? Was it Death Row Pac? Was it Me Against the World Pac? Um. I, to be honest with you, I can't remember which one of them damn albums was out of this. <laughs> um, the first time I met him, it wasn't even in New York. I think we was in Atlanta. I think we were at Freaknik, and he was standing outside a hotel smoking a blunt. Right, right. And, and Irv told me to get out the truck and go give him, you know, my CD and my sticker. And I did that, and that was like the first interaction I had with him, and as fate would have it, um, he knew a lot of people from Queens that I knew. So when he did come out here, 
we just ended up, because of being in the same circle, you know, being around each other.